So, a funny thing happened when I saw this movie. We got previews, of course, I think eight of them, and in almost every one of them, the world, or some part of a world, was ending. Star Trek Beyond, Independence Day 2, Assassin's Creed, Ghostbusters, Suicide Squad, Deepwater Horizon, Free State of Jones, and Warcraft. Well, okay, Warcraft wasn't shown, but <laughs> regardless, by the time 2016 ends, we will have witnessed the end of some part of a world about eight times. It's a bit overkill, don't you think? X-Men Apocalypse. Speaking as a fan who has seen every X-Men movie, and even has seen Wolverine Origins twice in theaters, I think this one is very good. The story follows the X-Men and the first mutant, Apocalypse. Preserved in a new body in the ancient times, he is awoken in the 80s and is crushed to find that man has lost his way. As he recruits his four horsemen, Charles Xavier welcomes new mutants into his school. When Raven drops by, expressing concern for Eric, Charles uses Cerebro to find him, in turn learning of Apocalypse. His plan is to cleanse mankind and create a new world order. But when the X-Men band together and embrace their power, it's a battle of brain versus brawn, and the X-Men need both to save the world. When we're talking about X-Men, we are talking about a franchise that began almost 20 years ago and was a huge milestone for the superhero genre. It was two years ahead of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, five years ahead of Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins, and eight years ahead of John Favreau's Iron Man. The general perception of the genre was more open-minded, much more forgiving. Nowadays, you go online and unfortunately most of the superhero articles are negative. Finding a positive piece is like finding Waldo. You know he's there, he's just very easily drowned out. Back when the first X-Men was being made, the mindset was very much the filmmakers praying to the movie gods that the world they were crafting would connect with an audience. They were, in essence, attempting to seduce us. Compare that phenomenon now to today. The mindset has shifted since the initial seduction. We are now very much in tune with the world and have developed an unquenchable expectation the filmmakers can only dream of meeting. Paying fans who have their own ideas and desires are accepting only up to a point. One must keep in mind we now have nine X-Men movies. Kind of exhausting, but mostly inspiring. With our new entry, Brian Singer, the X-Men's comfort director, is batting for the fourth time. He is joined by Simon Kinberg. The two were also paired up for Days of Future Past, entry number seven. I enjoyed that film, but <laughs> it's got this... <sighs> it fell prey to this issue that's been frustratingly consistent throughout almost all of the X-Men movies, and that is the number of mutants present. The first movie handled this pretty well. The story had Wolverine at the center of an ensemble piece that, at the heart, was about the relationship between Charles and Eric. But with the sequels, there have always been other mutants brought on board, and more often than not, it's been just for eye candy and very little else. Thankfully, at the emotional core, it's always been about Wolverine, Professor X, and Magneto. Those three have been the guardians of this franchise, and for many films, Wolverine has been in the spotlight. Per the talents of the writers, the drama surrounding Wolverine and his past served as the backbone for X2. Last Stand put a lot of focus on Wolverine and the downfall of his love interest, Jean Grey. Origins Wolverine was about where he came from, and when the video game adaptation is more enjoyable than the movie, you know you've got a problem. Then, 2011 appeared, and we were given First Class. The breath of fresh air this franchise was in desperate need of. It gave brand new claws to a wounded franchise, and for me, it was the first time since X2 that I felt rewarded for being an X-Men fan. 
Of course, writing for these characters is not easy. But thankfully, after watching this movie twice, once in totally bullshit 3D, and then once more in, oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about, 2D, I am happy to report that, among other elements, the main emotional thread between Charles and Eric is still strong and worth investing in. Brian Singer has always been good with directing them. They are a superhero odd couple, if there ever was one. And I have to praise both James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender for their efforts. In my opinion, they give their finest performances as these characters in this movie. The characters we became acquainted with in First Class and Days of Future Past are also alive and well, but their contributions take a back seat to the three new principal X-Men, a young Cyclops, Nightcrawler, and Jean Grey. In my opinion, all three were cast well. Casting superheroes is a delicate matter because, in, especially in the case of X-Men, you must find someone who is not only able to convincingly act as though their power, whatever it is, is real, but you also have to find someone who isn't so eye-catching that they draw attention away from their fellow X-Men. And with a fair share of skill, the filmmakers avoided that. All three newcomers are enjoyable and project the necessary attitude to sell their power. Touching on the powers themselves, I came away pretty happy with how the story structured the use of everyone's powers. It does cost quite a bit to put them all on display, and it's very important that you show each X-Men doing their thing at least once, ideally more than once, and of course at the appropriate time. And in that regard, I say to Singer and Co, well done. With practice, you have learned from your mistakes. Another mistake corrected, and in fine fashion, was the pacing. Brian Singer has had his ups and downs over the years directing dramas, superhero movies, and the one kid movie he did. Most of them, for me, aren't as evenly woven as they could be. But with this movie, I think that Brian Singer has found his footing. In the context of the X-Men films, this one has the best pacing. It is balanced and confident. My favorite part out of this well-balanced meal is a scene with Magneto fairly early on. And it's one of those scenes that both times I saw it took my breath away. It is very tragic. I would say actually Shakespearean in tone. And the way it's written, directed, acted, edited, sound mixed, the whole nine yards, it is just outstanding. And even though it was just... It was hard to watch. I loved it. It's really bizarre, but it's one of those scenes. Another scene worthy of praise in my eyes is actually every scene with Apocalypse. He is, for me, the strongest villain the X-Men have battled. And having him in this movie reminded me that it's really... <laughs> it's one thing to write a fan villain into a movie. It's another thing to cast a very famous actor, a talented actor, in that role. It's another thing, quite another, to make that character memorable. And in this movie, Apocalypse hits all three. Oscar Isaac is well cast and delivers one of the most engaging performances. My notes for improvement are the following. Number one, The Four Horsemen. Part of this movie is spent with Apocalypse as he gathers his four horsemen, Storm, Psylocke, Angel, and Magneto. Now, bearing in mind how many characters are in this movie and how long this movie is, we run into the inevitable problem of severely underwritten characters. One of the worst cases is Angel. Didn't we see this character in Last Stand? It's a real shame because he's even more underwritten in this movie. How does that happen? even more underwritten. It's just an utter waste, and it's just there's so much potential with this character, but if I had to put it into two words, one word doesn't feel like enough. In two words, unnecessarily forgettable. Number two, emotional closure. It is revealed at one point that a character is related to another character, and one of them knows, one of them does not know. Now, as film cliches go, there is of course a scene where there is an opportunity for someone to say something, but 
when that time comes, do they actually say anything? No. The worst part is there is no good reason why they don't say anything. Number three, the Quicksilver sequence. Days of Future Past secured a dangerously high bar for this very special sequence, but thanks to Singer and team, Apocalypse offers a new visual feast that personally did not underwhelm. And yet, to contradict that, I actually had a hard time fully enjoying the sequence. It comes during a very dramatic and very emotional story beat, and the tone does this really weird, like, 360 shift from very serious to very funny and then back to very serious. And emotionally, it's jarring because a lot of good guy lives are in danger, and yet I am supposed to be enjoying having fun with Quicksilver doing his thing. And I would love to do that, but he got good guys in danger, and that's distracting me. So basically, it was challenging when I was hoping it would be seamless, if that makes sense. Now, believe it or not, having said that, I would actually rank Apocalypse in my top three favorite X-Men movies. My other two favorites are X2 and First Class. Next up in the ever-expanding X-Men universe timeline of films is Wolverine 3, which I am so stoked for. Holy crap. Hugh Jackman as the Wolverine last time ever. How is it going to end? No clue, but I can't wait. <laughs> oh boy. It's going to be surreal. Advanced tickets for sure. Yes. As for X-Men Apocalypse, I give it three and a half out of five stars. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Now, go be productive and watch a movie. X-Men wouldn't be a bad idea. Just saying.